Miss uh, Miller lost her car keys the other day. We checked the cameras. Those car keys just vanished. And she was telling me in the hospital, Miss Joyce did, it cost her $500 to get her car towed and get all those keys replaced. So I'm not laying my keys down any, anywhere else except right here. So don't mess with that key right there. That's important. Hey, a couple of public announcements uh, at your tables. There's some sheets that are coming around. How many of you are heading out Friday with us to Jefferson? Man, I hope you are. And even if you didn't sign up, you can sign up today. You can just come by and let me know. All, all I need to do is let the restaurant there know about how many are coming. So if, if you want to go with us on Friday, uh, th this Friday, that's 48 hours from now, uh, we'd love for you to head up there with us. You can take your own car. You can ride the bus with us. Actually, two buses. And we would love for you to uh, go with us. So for you that are going, uh, Pastor Mike is uh, sending around the exact itinerary, okay? All the information there, phone numbers and so on. But let me just walk you through for you that are going Friday. For you that are going with us, that are riding one of the vehicles, uh, we are, those vehicles are pulling out of this park at, uh, uh, parking lot at 10.06 a.m. And it doesn't matter if you're the wealthiest member here or if you're the poorest member. It doesn't matter if you're the star athlete or if you're not very, a, a very good player. It doesn't matter. The bus departs at 10.06 a.m. Now, some of you are looking at me like, why 10.06? Because you'll remember that, okay? Why is it that we only use four dots on the clock when there's 60, all these minutes around, and we just use four of them, all right? So we're, we're leaving at 10.06 a.m., heading over to Austin Street Bistro. The restaurant will be hours. We're going to eat between 11 and 12. The whole restaurant's hours, okay? When we get through with that, We'll break into two groups. Some of you want to go on the pilgrimage. In fact, most of you want to go on the pilgrimage. We'll go right down Austin Street, let you pick up your ticket, and, and we will transport you to each one of these four or five homes, and we'll just have a woohoo super time touring, all right? We'll come back. We'll connect with the shopping group, and then we'll head back to Longview, all right? For you that are shopping, you're, uh, you're going to be shopping, Okay. So you'll be walking the street right there. Uh, if we can, I'll leave one bus back there. We'll just see. It looks like most of us want to go on the pilgrimage. And I believe at discount rate, that's going to be 22 bucks. You'll, you'll pay for that when you pick up your ticket. Or if you decide when you get there, hey, I, 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 I want to go shopping. Well, then go shopping. It's fine. But uh, we, we can figure that out when we get there. And then uh, we're going to head back. I think I got it around 1.30 or so. We'll head back. Should be here by 2.20 or so in the afternoon, uh, depending on how, tired, how exhausted I am driving back, all right? Now, if you get on my bus, there's not going to be any talking on the way home. Everybody takes a nap, including the driver, and we'll just trust the Lord, all right, that he'll get us back safely. Now, we're going to have a great time. So if you have any questions afterward, come up. Uh, ne next item, uh, I think uh, Pastor Mike mentioned it, picnic on Sunday we got 40% chance of rain, and so uh, if it rains, we're, we're going to picnic inside up there, all right? Too, too, too much stuff to set up and tear down, so be sure you're there. I, I sense that Pastor Mike either wants to say something or ask a question. Do, do you have that sensation as well? Is there someone standing next to me that it's a gnat of life or something? Pastor Mike, what can we do for you? Conference, conference, 1045 or 1006? Well, this is Spring Fling. Okay. That's one separate event. Okay. Th these two events are three weeks apart. <laughs> okay, thank so, you. yes, they're separate well, times. But... Okay. All right. So, uh, finally, you have a green sheet. Is that officially green? There's a green sheet at your table? We are starting sign-up now for the next event. Aren't you excited? Hey, you wanted a big senior adult calendar, man. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, we're rolling, all right? You asked for it, you got it, all right? We're heading out to Bar C. That's our new place with a big pavilion out there. We've got Clark Anthony's uh, uh, Bluegrass Southern Gospel Band that's coming in. They're going to be on a big trailer right off the pavilion. And uh, we're going to be heading out there on Thursday, May 13th, all right? May 13th. 
if you think you want to go on that, you can start signing up. We're going to sign up the next three weeks. Only reason I need to know that is about how much food to prepare. All right, we're heading out there from 11 until 1. All right, uh, I have hammocks set up if you need to nap and rock, whatever you need out there. There's great bathrooms out there. So everything's taken care of for you. Uh, ben Rogers is going to be uh, running a smoker on that day. We're cooking out. Great sides. We are asking, if you can, to give us five bucks to help defray some of the cost on the food. If you don't have five dollars, don't you worry about that. Maxie Bruner is going to pay for everyone that doesn't have five dollars. All right. So Maxie says, Pastor, try to get five dollars out of all of them. But if they don't have five dollars, try to find me and you can get it out of me. All right. So, hey, you can go ahead and start signing up for that. If you want to ride out there with us, we leave here at 1045. Uh, if you want to meet us out there, the address and so all that's on the sheet, all right? Enough announcements. Grab your Bible, Psalm 119. Did you bring your outlines back from last week? If you don't have one, maybe Pastor Mike will sell you one of those. Here's what we are doing. By the way, look around not many people preach through Psalm 119. I, I, I just want to go on record again and say, not many people preach through Psalm 119. You don't see a lot of sermon series, six, seven, eight, nine weeks in Psalm 119. Augustine said back in the fourth century, uh, he just left that out of his exegetical study of the Psalms. He just skipped completely over it. Interesting. But it is a bear to grab a hold of. And so what we're doing is we're taking a couple of weeks to do what I'm just calling a kind of a broad overview. By the way, I would probably say last week's session was probably stirred up more comments than it really, uh, I don't know, in, at least in the top three since we had more at midweek. So some of you, I guess, really kind of got into what we were talking about last week and appreciate all the positive feedback. Appreciate the concerns at times as well. But we continue today. And what I've done is I've just charted out five observations about Psalm 119. Uh, they are general in nature, um, but we're going back and looking at scriptural evidence of this. Remember, we're talking about the longest chapter in the Bible. And with all of these sections, we've already kind of started to unfold and uh, I guess, guess unearth some of the components. Just be reminded from last week, Psalm 119 is not some history of how the Bible was written. For you that think, hey, I guess that's uh, how the Bible came about. Absolutely not. That's that's not what Psalm 119 is. It's hearing the heartbeat of a psalmist and how the Word of God relates to him, the ongoing working of God's Word in his life, and he's sharing a picture of that. And so with that in mind, let's uh, grab our outlines from last week, and let's just uh, quickly do a little, a, a little snap review and... Uh, there's so many great things here. Uh, hate, to, hate to skip over any of them, but we'll never get out of the review if I don't quickly move on. We talked about formal and, and, and material principle last week. Um, no need to really say much more about that. Uh, the five elements. We started off by talking about that this is an acrostic poem. Did you get that first element? We went back and talked a little bit about the Hebrew alphabet and how each one of these sections is going to correspond, these 22 sections, these 22 letters. And that's why you'll see Aleph or Beth or Daleth or one of the letters in the Hebrew language that begin each one of these sections. Now, remember in the Psalms, and most of you know this, in the Psalms collectively... There are three that really deal specifically with God's Word. Psalm 1, Psalm 19, and Psalm 119. Those three are Torah 
law psalms, if you will. And so we are in the largest of those. And it uses this acrostic poem, and we jotted that down. And then we spent a lot of time on the second element on your outline. We've got that one knocked out. We said it uses basically eight synonyms or promise pattern words. And just if you were not here, here they are. We, we, we jotted down law, testimony, or statute. You, really interchangeable there. Now remember, all these words are related. They're, they're what? They're synonymous. They're cousins, if you will. Precepts, decrees, commands, ordinances, word and promise. Those were the ones that we worked through last week, looking at all of those. The synonym promise pattern. And then we had just gotten about half of the third element, and here's what we jotted down in the third overview statement. Psalm 119 reflects on the psalmist circumstances. And I was showing you last week when our time expired about that the psalmist, the first little subheading there, lives, he, he was struggling living in this culture that was, and we, I just use this word, foreign to him or alien. It was like, hey, I'm on this biblical track and the world around me is not on that track. And we went through and we were looking at these verses. When we finished last week, we finished with this monumental concept. Do you think the disciples, I, I use Peter and John, but do you think knowing that Acts 5, 40 and 41, that's where we closed last week, the first time that the apostles, at least that we have on record, outside of Jesus' presence with them, they were really persecuted. They were flogged. They were whipped. But prior to that, we said they had tremendous success. In fact, a lot of notoriety. And we ended last week by saying, do you think Peter ever kind of looked at John or one of the other apostles looked at each other and said, hey, 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 is this really how things are supposed to be gone? Uh, Going, I preached and 5,000 people gave their life to Christ. And because of that, we started having to get extra help. And we started small groups. And, and, and hey, and, and just a few days later, I preached again and several thousand more came to Christ. And everywhere I go, people are clamoring. They like me, I think. And you think that Peter ever looked at John and said, hey, 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 is this really how it's supposed to be? Didn't Jesus tell us just before he went to the cross, hey guys, remember this important lesson. Those that love me, they're going to love you. But those that hate me, boy, are they going to hate you as well. And there was a short stint, a short period of time there that apparently the apostles, at least we don't have any scriptural account of it, we don't have any extra biblical uh, accounts that I'm aware of, whether it be Josephus or anyone else, that says, boy, the disciples, even prior to their preaching, were really getting spanked. People were really on them. Man, they were having a hard, hard time. They were being persecuted. In fact, just the contrary to that, but all of a sudden the brakes slam on when we get to Acts 5, and there's that moment that, hey, now we're starting to see the real, at least physical persecution of what these disciples, what these apostles, if you will, are walking through. And so I just ended up last week by saying, is it our place in society, and maybe Psalm 119 will speak into this for us, is it our place to be on a pity party about all, what has happened to our nation? Where has our great Christian nation gone? You know, and we can get on this pity party, can't we? And maybe it's really time for us to resurrect Psalm 119 and other incredible passages like it and say, you know what? Let that persecution come on. The Bible says we're going to be experiencing that, and we're just going to rejoice that we have the Word of God. We're going to delight in it. We're going to follow it and obey it, and we're going to trust Him totally. 
And so those were the kind of the concepts that we wrapped up with last week. So let's get the second part of these circumstances. We've dealt now with the, the psalmist living in an alien culture. Let's jot down this fact. He also is living in a very discouraged moment in his life. That's an that's a obvious thing. He's facing great discouragement. Now take the text again, Psalm 119. And let's, uh, let me just show you some evidences of this so we can get a better flavor of that. Go all the way over to verse 141, Psalm 119. Go all the way over to verse 141. Just follow along with me like we did last week. Here's what the, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 141. Though I am lowly, does that sound like he's pretty pumped up? <laughs> Though I'm lowly and despised, I will not forget your precepts. Go all the way back to the early part. Look in verse 25. Look in Psalm 119, 25. Well, they're all 119. Look in verse 25. Lord, save us. Is this simple enough? Lord, grant us success. By the way, in the Hebrew language, I hope, I hope your translation, whether you're holding the Holy Scroll, the King James, or if you're holding a revised version, did you have exclamation marks. There in the Hebrew language, that suggests with great exuberance. And so in the English, many times, they'll, they, they will use an exclamation mark to try to point that out in verse 25. Look in verse 28. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and, and I will exalt you. Can I just ask a question? Has your spouse ever, or did your spouse ever, ask you if you love them? Oftentimes our insecurities are felt and exclaimed through what? Trying to reassure ourselves, or even at times, even what? Asking the question, do you love me? Or we could turn that and say, you love me, don't you? Or when we're really insecure, I could say, my wife loves me. My, lo my, my wife loves me. I could get on the bus going to Jefferson and say, my wife loves me. And say it four or five times and finally would say, somebody would say, Pastor, are you trying to reassure yourself? And I might need to be honest and say, well, I kind of am. Look at verse number 83. Go over to verse number 83. Verse number 83. Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke. <laughs> now there's a visual picture. Many of you have read the book, Putting the New Wine in the Old Wineskins. There's some great imagery here. Again, the stretching, the whole stretching mechanism here, the whole uh, understanding of that fermentation inside that skin that's going on and it puffing up and it's stretching. The psalmist says, I'm, I'm being stretched. But let me show you this. Man, the, here's the real kicker, I think, in the whole chapter. Go to verse 36, 136, I'm sorry, 136. Now, when you first read these words, you think, wow, the psalmist is so moved with his discouragement. But here's a little twist on these dark days that he's kind of walking through in terms of uh, some of the things he's facing from a societal standpoint. Not only he feels like an alien, but he's discouraged. But look at the whole verse, 136. Streams of tears flow from my eyes. Now, if we just stop there, we'd say, well, man, he's really discouraged. He's crying. But look at this next statement. For your law is not what? It's not obeyed. I love this moment. Maybe we'll talk about it more in the next five or six weeks. I love this moment because do you see his heartbreak or empathy? Not so much from what he's facing, but because of so many around him that are missing what? The word and the relationship with God. 
Do you see the empathy there? Do you hear it? Do you feel it? Do you sense it? This all adds to discouragement. Go back to verse number 53. We could go on and on here. I'll, I'll probably cut the rest of these out, but let's just look in verse 53. Indignation, gri uh, indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. Again, it's not about his loss, but it's just the heartbreak and the frustration. You know what I thought about? Jesus, over there in late in Matthew, walks into the city of Jerusalem. You, do, I mean, do you remember this moment? And he, and he pronounces woe on the entire city. Remember that? Woe to all those people. He's pointing the whole, out to the whole city. A little later in that day, we find Jesus weeping over the city. What, what a gripping moment. I don't know where you are with our nation, but I think it is a sad, sad state of affairs. It is a sad, sad state of affairs. Don't have all the answers. Have the answer. But what, what a sad state that we find ourselves in. How, how, how did we come to this place? But it's our reaction. And again, as you and I face these circumstances, maybe as we go through in these coming weeks, Psalm 119, as we take certain specific sections and zoom in, take a magnifying glass and get really close to some of these key sections, maybe, maybe, maybe God is going to speak to us about our circumstances. Well, we've got to move on. Let's jot down this fourth one. We, we, man, we've man, we got a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of ground to cover here. I need to finish this overview. Number four, we see in Psalm 119 the powers, plural, the powers of Scripture. Now, yeah, you can put power of Scripture. I'm just suggesting to you that this is manifested in a number of ways. Let me illustrate and, 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 and we'll try to go very quickly. I made a note here. I don't know if I put it on yours or not, but this section, as we kind of look at an overview of this, gives us an indication of how the Word of God functions in the psalmist's life, but it also is going to be an amplification for us. It, it's going to build it up, make it bigger to help us understand what the Word of God should be functioning, how it should be working in our lives. So with that in mind, I think I just jotted three of those down. Let's make note of them, and I, I want you to see them. First of all, one of the powers that's mentioned here is that the Word of God should bring about in us a sensation that we want to rejoice in God. In other words, that we want to delight in God. Oftentimes, you hear a pastor, poor old Josh, may get up and say, some of you aren't singing today, or hey, we need a smile on her. Oh, old Josh is telling the choir tonight during choir rehearsal, hey, you set the tone for the service. You need to have a big what? Smile. I, I wish, hey, I've done this a couple times. I know in Albuquerque I do this. I secretly filmed from the, well, it wasn't the baptistry because we had a remote baptistry, but uh, from, 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 from the very back area back up there where the choir stands, I just put the camera on and let it run the whole service. Three weeks in a row where I was filming people's reactions. Interesting. Because, as you know, I just look at the exit signs. But when I went back and began to watch it, there was my buddy, old Boo Brantley. Sound asleep. I knew that. We caught a few people doing things. Well, we just, hey, we need to cut that out. But the big takeaway for me watching people was how somber people were. Old Maxie Bruner said, hey, I got some tickets to the Lobo game. He let me sit with him a couple years ago. 
I didn't get to see much of the game, but I got to talk to Maxie, okay? But anyway, that's a different story, all right? No, it was a great game. We saw a great, great, great game. But, uh, you know, I, I just watch people come in. Nobody's unhappy at a football game. I mean, they're carrying popcorn, horns. They're full of energy. Now, this is at 7.30 at night in the heat of the summer. Bugs, mosquitoes, humidity. It's a terrible environment. You go to the bathroom. A stadium bathroom is not the most sanitary of all bathrooms. You know what I'm saying? And it doesn't matter what happened. People are pumped up, juiced up, band boosters, football boosters, flowers, all kinds of stuff, commotion, activity, life, overflowing. It's a community event. But boy, you let Sunday morning come along. Soft, big bottom chairs. 72 degrees, no bugs. Well, how you doing today? Well, I'm all right. It's been a long week. Well, we're going to take an offering today. Well, I spent all my money out at the ball game. You know, those season tickets went up again. Then my grandkids, we spent $38 at the concession stand. And then the pastor gets up and preaches. And it's like... That's the longest sermon I've ever heard. And then the music, during the music, it's like, why are we singing the same words over and over and over? Well, we sang the same school song. How many times did the band play? We, we hear it every time they score. We heard it at the beginning when the team came out. At halftime, we sang it again. The, the viewettes, I mean, they're doing the same routine every time. But boy, it's new and fresh. Yes or no? And so I'm just suggesting to you as we look at this, you put it in the pipe and smoke it however you want to do it. I would suggest to you that one of the things that the Word of God should be doing in our lives, if we're really in fellowship with the Lord and in Him, in the covenant, as you and I are connecting with the Word of God, there should be some go-go juice. There should be some rejoicing and delight. But I know you, you look at me like, I don't believe that. Well, let me show it to you, okay? Go to verse number 14. Let's just walk through. Gosh, I got a bunch of them. Let's just pick three or four out here. Let's, let's, let's look in verse 14. I rejoice. He didn't say, verse 14, well, I just... It just, it makes me a, a slimmering happy. No, he said, I rejoice in the following your statutes. As one rejoices in, now look at this. Now let's, now let's be sure we get it, okay? I thought about at our spring fling, giving away a gift. Have like a drawing, give away a gift of some sort. And, uh, can, but can you imagine... If somehow some local merchant said, hey, I got this treasure chest, Pastor. I heard at Oakland Heights you were having a lot of seniors out, having a big feed for them, big concert for them. Here, maybe old Judd down the road, my friend Judd Murray, maybe old Judd said, hey, take this treasure chest from, from Murray Jewelry and give it away to one of your seniors. And can you imagine? Now, now think about this for a moment. You get out there. And the drawing takes place. And let's say Al wins it. Now, have you ever heard Al speak? How many of you have never heard Al speak a word? Come on. More hands than that. You better lift them up. I'm, Al, it's hard to ever hear him speak anything. And, oh, I look at me. Reserve, I mean, this, this one, a few times I've seen him really smile. And I mean, I mean look. And, and so Al opens the treasure chest. And let's say it's filled with authentic diamonds. This is the response I think I would, he would open and go, well, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> that might be all we get. Man, if I open, I'd go, are you kidding me? Hey, this has got to be fake. I'm taking this 
chest full of diamonds up to up there in Murray Jewelry and to be sure I want them to look at it. In fact, I don't even trust them. I'm going downtown to another jeweler because they, I bet there's some kind of, what do they call it, Zarconis or some kind of fake look, diamond lookalikes or whatever they are. And, and you get down there and you say, hey, this thing is worth millions of dollars. Do you see that in this verse? It's like, hey, the word of God it means to me as much as the greatest of treasures. Do you see the, the rejoicing? Do you see the delight in that? Look in, look in verse number 16. Look in verse 16. The, the Lord's, uh, the, well, let me get in the right psalm. It is 119, and here we go. Uh, I delight in your decrees. I will not de- n- neglect your word. There, there, there's the description again. Verse 14 fleshes it out better uh, exactly how big a deal it is, this rejoicing. But now we get into what we call the delight portion. Go over to verse 97. Now, in here, I don't know why, but for some reason, we're attracting more at midweek great Bible teachers here. And I'm not a great Bible teacher. I'm one of those, I mean, I look at Dr. Farrell. I look at, I mean, I look at some tables over here and tables over there. Some of you are great. T- look, look right over here, Mr. Don, lifetime biblical educator, collegiate, you know, collegiate here with Dr. Farrell. I mean, big time people, not me. But what I, what I, de- what I detected from this is for you that are really high up on scholarship, I, I love this. I mean, this is a bonus. I bet no one's ever showed you this before, but I, I, I would wager that. But look in verse 97, for you that are into the scholarship thing. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on what? Day and night. Or all day what? Law. Boy, Dr. Farrell gets up in the middle of the night and he starts reading. Or Don gets home and, I mean, as soon as his lesson's over on Sunday, he's already processed to get that next out. I mean, those kind of folks, many of you, you are scholars. You are driven with scholarship. You love it. There's that love from a scholarship standpoint. But here is what is so unique. Look down at verse 72. Look at the flip side of this. Look in verse 72. On the flip side of that, the law from your mouth, the law from your mouth is more precious to me than a thousand pieces of silver and gold. Just from a simple discipleship stance. For you that are like me, just kind of the ordinary folks, what does the word mean to us? Well, it means more than our bank account, it means more than our wedding ring, it means more than our Retirement account means more than any uh, material possession that, that, I mean, that we have. This word means so much to you that join me that are just the ordinary. Are you kind of starting to get the sense of what we're going to uncover as we walk through Psalm 119? The psalm is struggling. But one of the big components in the longest chapter in the Bible is the heartbeat of this psalmist that says, let me tell you something. I may be discouraged, but there's something about this repetitive statute, decree, the law, the word, the promises. As they unfold in my life, they bring a level of rejoicing in my heart And that transcends to my face, to my mannerisms, to my attitudes. Sunday is my new game day, not Friday night, but Sunday is my game day. 
because that is the day of my overflowing with the fellow, fellow believers as we come and celebrate all that God has done in the previous week. And the fight songs of God are being sung. And it's not an obligation to buy tickets, but it's my blessing to be able to give of just a portion of what God has poured out in my life just to give a portion back to his work. And, and, and you know what? It's a blessing for me to be able to do that. And you know what? I, I just can't believe it. It's 1143 already and the pastor stopped, doggone it. I wish he would have just kept on. <laughs> Amen. Good job, David Miller, just like I told you. Man, you dropped that at the perfect time. <laughs> Second power, the love for Scripture. Not just I rejoice in it and I delight in it, but the actual love for it. Now, I know some of you are looking at that and you say, well, you're kind of splitting hairs there. Well, that would be hard on the top of my head at any point. But here, I want to emphasize how much he loves it. Not so much the outward expression and the inward building of the emotion, but when we put the connotation of love, that changes the whole dimension. Look in verse 47. We've got to hurry. You're not listening fast enough. I delight in your commands because I love them. Do you see that in verse 47 while we're there? Looking for verse 48. I reach out for your commands, which I what? I love that I might meditate on your decrees. Go all the way over to verse 113. Verse 113. I hate double-minded people. Ooh, that's a strong word, isn't it? But I love your law. Do you see it? Look in verse 119. By the way, I, I jotted down in my notes. Here's kind of a strange twist on love. Look in, look in 119. Very unusual, very unusual this was stated this way. All the wicked of the earth, you discard like dross. Remember when we heat up metal materials and the impurities come to the top and they skim them? They skimming the dross off the top so it will, it will purify the gold, it will purify whatever precious metal that they're trying to get the, imp imp the uh, impurities out of. And again, wh what is that? that? That's called dross. And, and an incredible statement. He says, therefore, I love your statutes. You see what he's saying there? God is just. God brings about judgment, and I love him for that. There's no shortcuts. There's no favoritism. There's no corner cutting. We know exactly where we stand. And because of that, we're able to fully, fully put our arms around that covenant with God because we know exactly where he's going to be because he's consistent, he's steadfast, he's faithful. We can count on that. And boy, do we live in a time of uncertainty. And, and the psalmist says, I love that. Verse 127, 128. Verse 127, 128. Because I love your commands more than gold and, and more than pure gold. And because I consider, verse 128, all your precepts right. I hate every wrong path. But again in verse 127, I love your commands. Look in verse 132. We're right there by it. Turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. We could go on and on. 140, 165. But let's move on. Third, third element. Not just rejoicing, the delight part. Not just love. But the word of God apparently to the psalmist calls him into a different realm of reverence. In other words, a sense of awe a sense of fear, a sense of respect. Let's just look at three or four of these. Look in verse 120. My flesh trembles. I fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. We kind of get that feeling. Though. Go to verse 161. This may be even a more vivid uh, illustration of this. Rulers persecute me. Remember us talking a little earlier about he felt like an alien? He was being persecuted. He says, let me tell you what's going on in my life right now in this culture that I live in. The government is hammering me. Leaders, my leaders are really getting after me. But look at what he says. This is, this is an amazing contrast. They persecute me without cause. But it's almost like, you see, but? Here's the contrast. It's like, you're hammering me 
But that doesn't seem to worry him, does it? He's more concerned, look in the second part of verse 161, but my heart trembles at your word. He doesn't say, I tremble because you persecute me. He just makes a quick reference. Hey, the leaders around me, they're persecuting me. It's kind of like, no big deal. But boy, what I'm concerned about is following your decrees and your word and not being right with you. Wow, what an incredible picture. Look, look in verse 38. Look in verse 38. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. God, if you do anything great in my life, through me, or around me, I want you to do so not to edify me, but that your presence might be known mildly so people will come to fear you. Well, the powers of Scripture. We've got to move on. Number five. Let's mention this. How are we doing on time? Golly. Let's talk about, finally, benefits. We're not going to finish, but let's get as far as we can. The benefits of Scripture. Now, of these five elements that I wanted to show you today, this is probably one of the most life-changing. These benefits. And I just jotted down three or four of these benefits. Not mine, but what the psalmist points out. The first one is around just the word liberation. This deep liberation or freedom. You and I cannot study Psalm 119. We can't spend a couple of months here and not be moved by the psalmist making these affirmative statements that the scripture has so impacted his life that he has a whole release and a freedom and a whole new dimension of liberation in his life. Quickly look at it, verse 45. Let me just show it to you in the scripture first. I will walk about in, did you get it? In freedom. For I have sought out your precepts. I'm telling you, verse 32 maybe gives us maybe one of the best pictures of this. Looking back in verse 32. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened. Do you see that? You've broadened my understanding. I'm going to really talk about this in just a second before we go to lunch, okay? Okay. But let me, let me show you one more. Look in verse 100. Go to verse 100. I have more understanding than elders, for I obey your precepts. Real quickly, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 2, and would you scroll down to verse 14? We share this and we send you to lunch. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Often looked over passage. I bring it here because it speaks to this element of freedom and liberation. Paul helps us flesh that out so we better understand it. Here's what 1 Corinthians 2.14 and following says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. Now keep reading and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Now here's where it really gets really good. Verse 15, the person with the Spirit, is everybody with me? The believer, the person that's walking in the, in, in the way of the Spirit, with the Spirit, the Spirit indwelt person. Listen to this. They make judgments about, are you ready? All things. Now keep reading. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. Let's think about the old pagan bloat of first century. He's kind of an old carnal guy, kind of rough around the edges. Maybe he grew up on one of the beaches there in first century life. He's a pagan, so he's not led by the Spirit. And in his life, he, he, the only way he can process is he separates his ethos, the ethics and the morals 
from the religious. They're two totally separate things to him. That's all that he knows. In fact, when he gets ready to take a trip on a vessel, well, he immediately begins to offer up a great sacrifice to Neptune, his god of the sea. Or if at work, he's called on to make a presentation or a speech. He immediately begins to make gifts and sacrifices to Hermes, the god of communication that he worships. And, and, and for him, I mean, the sleeping around in the pantheon, I mean, all of the stuff that's going on, it's, it's very compartmentalized, and that's all he's able to see. He's not able to see any reflection of a spirit-filled life. He's not able to see anything outside of that scope. That's it for him. These gods, his morals, his values, surviving through life, he can see nothing else. But you let that first century pagan, that bloat, be saved and transformed in Christ. All of a, all of a sudden, the Spirit allows him to be able to see things he's never seen before. Ever. He's never experienced God. He's never really fully understand to, uh, stood to this moment what sin is and how God forgave him of that sin. He's, he's, he's never been exposed to God three persons but one God. These are things that are totally foreign to him until this moment. In fact, in fact, his whole worldview now is so much larger than it was. He's able to see things that he's never, ever seen before. And I ask you today, if we take the average American and we say, do you think they're more concerned about moral failure or physical fear? Nine times out of ten, you're going to answer correctly and say, well, I would probably say physical fear because you have unsaved people all the time. You're out there in the boat. And your paddles slip away from you, and all of a sudden the atheist, the agnostic, begins to pray to a God that they don't even believe in. And I would just suggest to you that the use of the law, this liberating law, the law helps us be reshaped, reordered. It's, it's more, as we talked about than last week, legislation and commandments. It's, it's not just limited to that, but it is that. And I just end today by making this observation for you. Are you listening? You and I right now are in the midst of a great cultural war because contemporary thought out there right now, even in the covenant fellowship, even in evangelical life, we have this contemporary thought that's running rampant in our church, in other churches, and the thought is very simple. It's that as believers, you and I think now that because we're free in Christ, that for some reason, we're able to trust our own hearts and our own judgments as to what is now the right or the wrong way. And that is such a prevalent thing in our churches today. It's being expressed in all kinds of ways. Here's a deacon. Not just a member, but a deacon. Been married 21 years. And all of a sudden at work, he, begin, he, he begins to notice this co-worker. And something inside of his heart reminds him, and he trusted. He says, you know, the Lord's plan for me is clear, and the Lord wants me to be fulfilled and happy and prosperous. So somehow, someway, he justifies in his mind to leave the wife of 21 years that has been faithful to him and has provided motherhood for his three children. And he decides in his own righteousness in this freedom walk with Christ, that you know what, I'm now going to take up with this woman because she makes me happy. But in his mind, contemporary thought, 
Isn't that really ultimately what the scriptures say? I'm, I, I will prosper you. I want you to, be, to live a life of happiness. And all of a sudden, the word of God becomes the precepts and the commands become a secondary issue for him. And his happiness, he's trusting his own emotion and heart. It begins to lead him. Listen to what John Calvin said. John Calvin says, God is only rightly served when the law is obeyed. We are not free to frame a system of religion according to our own judgment. The whole of the scripture is nothing else than the exposition of law. Listen to the, to, to the late J.I. Packer when he was talking about the, the Puritans. He, he, he made this observation. He said, the root cause of our moral flabbiness is that we have neglected God's law. Morally flabby. That brings us to the place in all of our lives that we begin to excuse all kinds of things that culture and agenda are pushing. And you and I say, well, you know what? It's a big deal out there in culture. And even though the Bible says not to do that, you know what? Maybe it's probably good that, you know, it's okay. And we began to trust our heart. And even though we think, you ask the, the university student today, let's go out to Laterno, a Christian university, and ask them about God's commands and precepts and decrees. And I'm telling you, deep down in their heart, many of them will push back from that because they think it is less liberating and there's less freedom in Christ. You go to the typical high school student today and ask them, you're going to get, you, you ask the typical millennial. And time and time again, you're going to hear from them something very important. We don't want to be restrained from that. And I would just suggest to you, in fact, let me read it to you. I know, we, we got to go. I got it, I got it. Listen to verse 44 and 45. Amazing. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. You know that I am a certified driver's ed instructor in the state of Texas. But I've noticed in Longview, Texas, something very interesting over the last couple of weeks. I've noticed that when you come to, and there's just a few of them here in Longview, a true four-way stop. That people act very weird at four-way stops in Longview, Texas. Now you would think there's no law as to what you do at four-way stops. But the law is very clear. If you're there by yourself, you come to a complete stop at the white line. If there's no white line, your front bumper at the edge of the stop sign, you look both ways and you proceed on your way. If two people come then at, at, at the approximate time, then the one that gets there first comes to a complete stop first. That's why people rush up the earth, throw on the brakes. Whoever comes to a complete stop first, they should have what? The right of way. But let's say it's a close tie. Then it says you're supposed to yield to one another by what? By hand signals. I told you it gets creative. It's always dangerous to use hand signals. We won't get into that. But at times there's three people. At other times there's four people. The craziest driving I've ever seen is in Honduras over on mission trip. People blow their horn the whole time they drive. Me, 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 me. And I asked, I asked our driver one time, hey, what does all that mean? Oh, you have to live here a long time to understand it. These quick repetitive, they're just warning you that they're coming and they're moving at a high rate of speed. Well, what are these long pauses in, on the horn? Well, that's people that want certain things. They want you to pay attention to them. They're wanting to turn here or whatever. And I said, well, what, what does it mean when they really lay on the horn? He says, don't ask. They're cussing at you in horn language. But the law says this, once there has been a designated person when there's three or four cars and one goes, then the ascending cars go in, are you ready, clockwise fashion. There is a law. 
But people either don't know it, but in most cases they just act as if it was not even there. Isn't it something as you walk up the steps to our Supreme Court building? Fact. You'll see Moses displayed up there above them. Fact. I think one of the great takeaways from Psalm 119 is going to be us coming to the understanding that when we obey the precepts, the law of God, it's not more restrictive. But if we could tap into the knowledge of what the psalmist write to us in this moment to say, if you'll just be obedient, you'll see things that you've never seen before. You'll experience things you've never experienced before. You will live things you've never lived before. It will be so free, so liberating. And living in his precepts is so delightful and wonderful. I think that's what brought him to tears. Just as it brought our Lord and Savior to tears as he looked out over that city of Jerusalem and was so heartbroken. Maybe that's what God is really waiting on in America. He's waiting on enough broken hearts to really bring about the dramatic change that we so desperately need. We pray, we go to lunch. Lord, we thank you for these moments that we've had in your word. As we continue to inch along now, would you just use this psalm to stir us to bring about a greater recollection, a reflection upon your word. Father, help us to be obeyers of your word. We know that in these incredible moments when we live in your spirit, that your spirit subdues the natural inclination that drives us into these harbors that are no good for us. But we know it's that same spirit that enables us to allow the word of God to do tremendous work. So, Father, we bring the word week after week, day after day into our hearts and our lives. Would you use it now to bring about the transformation that you desire? In these things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you on Friday. Have a great lunch.